Hello and welcome everyone. Again, my name is Sierra King and I am the Director of Admissions and Program Services at the Data Incubator. I'm joined by an incredible group of panelists and TDI graduates who will introduce themselves very soon. And we have promised you an excellent info session today where we will be discussing imposter syndrome in STEM and how to overcome it. To start things off, I would like to give you a quick overview of our program and everything that we offer at the Data Incubator. We'll then go into detail about what imposter syndrome is, who it impacts, and some tips for overcoming it. Again, please place all of your questions in the Q&A section and we will answer them at the end of our presentation today. And as a reminder, our session is an hour long, so if we don't get to all of your questions, please email us at admissions at the data and we will be happy to help you. We will also drop that email address in the chat box at some point, so it'll be easy for you to access. So if you are new to the data incubator, you may be wondering who we are and what we do. Well, the data incubators programs are designed to train academics for careers as data scientists and data engineers in the business world. We're able to accomplish this goal with our outstanding curriculum and instructors, and each week of our program focuses on a different data tool or approach, and students will work on weekly mini projects that focus on the tools they're studying. Each student completes a capstone project that applies what they've learned into a real world problem of their choosing. And then in addition to our technical training, we provide weekly soft skills training to help our graduates find a job in their field. And we've seen in our data science program, about 82% of our graduates are working as data scientists within six months of completing their program. And our graduates are working in over 55 different industries, including software, IT, internet, financial services, biotech, and many more. You can probably name an industry and there's more than likely uh, one of our graduates working there. So speaking of TDI graduates, I am joined today by some of our alumni. And one thing that I would like to note is all of us on the panel here today have struggled with, are currently struggling with, or are likely to struggle with imposter syndrome at some point in our careers. And we really want to share our experiences with you and some helpful tips. So at this point, I'm going to ask our panelists to introduce themselves now. Starting with Matt. All right. Hi, everyone. My name is Matt, and I'm really happy to be here. And thanks for having all of us. Uh, so I work as a data scientist for Comcast Entertainment Division, where we um, look at a lot of uh, patterns and usage of people watching different types of content on our products and we uh, advise our product teams on how to make a better product for them using data um, so i'm very happy to be here and i had a really good time and learning a lot back when i was at tdi and uh, i think you'll hear a lot more about that as we go on today as well as my own struggles and sort of things that i do to cope with um, you know imposter syndrome and other related things. So thank you again for having me. Thank you, Matt, for joining us. And Andrew. Hello, I'm Andrew Grachik. Uh, as Sierra mentioned, I did attend the Data Incubator. In fact, Matt and I were classmates in summer 2020. So uh, it's good to see you again, Matt, uh, as always. And I came at, I am, as I like to say, a recovering academic. I was a visiting assistant professor of economics at Wake Forest University. So I have seen imposter syndrome both from the academic side and the industry side, and I've wallowed in it both times and tried to overcome it. And uh, yeah, I, I've, I went to the data incubator and then got a job at NN Data, uh, where I'm a senior data scientist now. And ironically, a lot of what I do is looking for imposters. So we often, a lot of our uh, analyses and data science techniques are geared towards anomaly detection. Uh, and we've worked for um, industry and government uh, contractors like uh, DARPA, um, Army Fire Team Controls, and now more recently TikTok and ByteDance, their parent company, uh, trying to find anomalous behavior and fraudulent activity. So it's kind of ironic that now I'm talking about uh, how to not feel like an imposter when most of my job is looking to identify them. And as an additional um, sort of plug to TDI, not only did I go through the full-time program alongside Matt in 2020, my wife, who's also a PhD and a academic person herself is currently going through the part-time program now. So 
I have you know sort of first and secondhand experience of two different programs that TDI offers. Well, we're glad to hear that, and I'm glad that you guys had a great experience in the program, and we are very excited to hear some of your insights about imposter syndrome. So we're going to start off our presentation with talking about what imposter syndrome is, what it can look like for you. So imposter syndrome is the internalized belief that your success is due to luck or other external factors rather than your own skills, talent, intelligence, or qualifications. And this false idea leaves you with a perpetual feeling of being a poser or under constant threat and fear of being exposed as a fraud. You begin to have feelings of uncertainty and self-doubt, as well as a sense that you've tricked people into allowing you to take on this position. And you're caught in a vicious cycle of inadequacy, guilt, and anxiety. And we will talk a bit more about this cycle later on in this presentation. Experts say that anytime you're facing a new challenge or you're out of your comfort zone, you're more susceptible to imposter syndrome. And this could be when you start in a new role, on a new team, or maybe you are working on a new or challenging project. And you may feel a sense of shame in informing others about your feelings, but you'll see as we go through this presentation that you are not alone in feeling this way. So a question for our panelists, can you tell us about a time that you felt like an imposter and maybe talk a bit about what happened and how it impacted you? Um, Matt, you want to go first on this one? I can. Um, I think a good background to give is I I started out as a data scientist in Comcast uh, after I'd gone through the TDI program. Uh, but in my previous sort of career, I I have very that is to say I I took a huge career pivot. I was a research administrator at a university, and before that, I did my um, doctorate in in you know in chemistry and engineering, where there is some data involved, but not to the scale of you know what you would encounter typically as a data scientist. So um, even when I was in the TDI program um, with a lot of um, you know my other colleagues uh, or, or classmates, as you would have it. Um, are in similar situation where they're doing career pivot. I, I do feel especially out of place because I don't feel I have a very strong, you know, the typical data science background like statistics or or or, or, or that kind of stuff. Um, but I think one thing. Um, well, so when I was also uh, hired at Comcast, um, that's also like the real deal. Now I'm actually working as a data scientist and it's so easy for me to think about like, well, I don't really have any like traditional like academic credential um, to, you know, sort of, uh, what's a way to put it, to justify myself as being in that position. Um, so there is that kind of disconnect that um, somehow I was able to uh, show that I have the merit to for the company that hired me that that they think I would fit in well in that position. But then I also feel like, was there some mistake? Like maybe I like, do I actually possess those qualities? And I feel like that conflict do play out a lot. Um, even till now, I've been in my company for all over a year now, and sometimes that feels still happens. Yeah. So I guess for me, you know, coming from academia. And then into data science, I've felt like an imposter for most of the last, you know, for a lot of the last, you know, decade of my life. Uh, I I pivoted going into grad school, and I pivoted coming out of grad school, uh, going into or, well, coming not going out of grad school, but going out of academia. So I've had a lot of times to to feel like I didn't quite belong. Um, uh, in fact, even going into the data incubator, I felt like I didn't belong because I felt like I didn't know enough about you know programming and data science, even though I knew the statistics to get in. So I am very well versed in feeling imposter syndrome. And one of the ways I've gotten over it, and I guess the first thing I'll say is that I don't think it's getting over it. It's a continuous process. You will, you know, just because you don't feel like you're an imposter today doesn't mean you won't in the future. It's a, it's a cycle. It's a continuous thing. And maybe we can talk more about that in some other slides. But 
the way I, I've gotten over it is thinking that, well, going, uh, you know, maybe Wittgenstein, or if I'm being more cynical, maybe nihilistic about it, that's saying qualifications are whatever they let you get away with, right? As long as I can, as long as I can do the things and people continue to let me do the things, then I guess I must be qualified. So you know, that's, that's one way to get you through at least the short term. I mean, we can talk about some more long-term strategies later. Yes, I definitely agree. We talk a bit about the cycle. Um, we will get to the cycle a little bit later on, but it definitely is something that pops up throughout your career. So these tips are going to be useful if you're experiencing it now, but it's more than likely when you're faced with a new challenge in the future, these feelings may spike up again, and these tips can be used at that time as well. So many of us have experienced imposter syndrome and may not have even realized it. So here are a few signs to help you determine if this is something that you're experiencing. It can start off with not believing you've earned your success by your own merits and instead attributing it to luck or other external factors. You may feel like you're not fill in the blank enough, and this can apply to various situations, not qualified enough, not smart enough, you have a different background than the other members on your team. So it's that internal feeling that you are not able to compare yourselves to your colleagues or the other individuals you're working with. You may have the inability to internalize success and be proud of your own intelligence, competency, and skills. And you may at times find yourself over-exaggerating your shortcomings and failures. And in turn, you might find yourself setting unrealistic goals and then feeling bad about yourself when you can't meet them. You may avoid new opportunities and challenges for fear that you won't be able to complete them or you'll be found out as a fraud if you're not able to complete them well enough or you find yourself placing your value in the ability to do it all and do it with excellence. And this can be displayed as showing perfectionist tendencies. So again, back to our panelists here, after hearing about some of the signs, do you feel like you've displayed any of these? And tell us a little bit more about that. I guess I'll jump in first this time. And I guess the short answer is yes, uh, most definitely. And the long answer is, I feel like anybody, I, I guess I'll, I'll say it this way, I would be worried about anyone who never felt any of this because what this means is really that you're being introspective and when you're being introspective when you're an analytical person or even if you're not it's easy to be really hard on yourselves because you only see the internal struggles of yourself you don't you only see the good results it's kind of like the uh the social media effect where everybody looks like they're living a perfect life because what they post on instagram is perfect and you compare yourself to that but their real life is not all that there's also other stuff too and but you only see the results of other people's work and you see the internal monologue and struggles of yourself and no one else. So I think basically, you know, I have, and I think basically everyone has, and I don't think it's necessarily a bad thing to feel that occasionally because it means that you're evaluating yourself. It's only when you let it overwhelm you and it becomes overwhelming that it's a problem. So uh, I don't know if you want to add that. Yeah, I, I agree completely. I feel like I just did it too. Like <laughs> over exaggerating your short came as I was just like, oh, I have a bad statistic background. Like I already just said that. Uh but I mean like I think like it's all relative. Uh so I definitely feel like um you know it's I think it's part of my personality. Like I can't speak for other folks to just really be like very careful and not to appear like like arrogant or, or whatever or something like that. But like you, you, you I do feel like I, I I have a tendency to overcompensate and be like, oh no, I'm just like, you know, it's just whatever I just did. Like, oh, it's not that, it's not that uh, difficult. It's, you know, like stuff like that. Um, but I feel like there's a danger um, if that becomes sort of your mantra where you just continue to emphasize that like, Oh, I'm not worth it being here. Uh, you guys are so great for, you know, having me here in my position. Like, I feel like, you know, it's one thing to be, you know, reflect, self-reflective and, um, you know, humble and all that kind of stuff. But you don't want to also dismiss the fact that, you know, other folks who hired you uh, and your coworkers, your manager or your supervisor, like all those people, like, you know, they're not like dumb. They they made a decision because they observed that I or whoever has whatever qualities that in their perspective they think fit with what they need. And that, you know, you don't want to dismiss that. 
and you do want to like if you i feel like for me if i had trouble believing in myself sometimes if i experienced like this connect that i said earlier like it's easier for me to think like well you know such and such think i can do it and you know such and such i believe them so if they believe in me then maybe there's something there and i find that to be helpful sometimes um but yeah it it it, 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 it definitely is it's the self-reflectiveness I think Andrew talked about also helps if you keep that in mind that uh, if you have a tendency to to exhibit this type of you know imposter syndrome thing to to reflect on those and ask yourself why do I feel that way and why do I um, do those things or think those thoughts and um, I feel that are usually helpful to see where that comes from and that can be helpful with coping the situation. I couldn't agree more. I think that all of these signs are things that on your own you can think or actions you can take where you're reflecting on your, your work, your work style, um, how you fit in. And that's all a normal thing to do is to reflect on your, your skills and your ability to work on the team you're on. But when you find yourself stuck in this cycle where you can't think positively or don't see your value, then that's where we want to come in and definitely help you to reframe your thinking. So again, all of these things are, are you will think them at some point, and it doesn't necessarily mean that you are experiencing imposter syndrome, but as we'll go into in more detail, once you find yourself perpetually stuck in this cycle and you're having trouble breaking it, that's where we want to come in and give you some tips and resources as well. Yeah, and if I could just say one more thing about that last bullet point, because I forgot to address it, but I think it's a very important one in, in this sort of, I don't know if it's our culture or just the, the need for perfectionism or just the kind of driven people that we often get to interact with. It is hard to feel like you're contributing if you're not the best. And even defining what the best is can be difficult. And we tend to think of it as a global thing, you know, I'm the best or I'm not the best. Whereas one thing that I think really helped me and it'll probably help you know, some of you out there in the, in, who are attending is, don't think about you being the best at a thing. Think about being the spaces in which you have knowledge and expertise. Because as I used to tell my students back when I was in, in academic, academia, you know, I was an expert in you know, the particular branches of economics that I taught. But I was like, there are things you know more about than I do. There's, this happens to be the thing I know a lot about, but there's always some, some angle that you are an expert and you might even be the best that you know. And the thing is to remember that there are things that you know that you care about, that you're driven by, that you do know more than the other people you interact with. And that's, keep in mind. I think that's a, a really great point, Andrew, as well. That's something that even in my career I've struggled with is that those last two points there is placing my value and the ability to do it all and do it with excellence. I have a tendency to overwork or not ask for additional support because I want it to come across as I've accomplished this project, this massive project on my own. And that's really not a great way of going about your work day and your career. There's no work-life balance there when you are constantly doing everything. So we'll talk a little bit about that as well, how you can overcome some of these signs. If this is something you find yourself stuck in doing while you're going out your career as well. So a little bit the unprecedented and unique pandemic situation in 2020 that is still going on, unfortunately, to this day, has caused a rise in imposter syndrome. In fact, 47% of workers worldwide reported feelings of imposter syndrome increasing since 2020. So feeling isolated from your team while you're working from home or if you're distributed is a very natural feeling at this time. Many of us were propelled into new positions as a result of COVID-19, and some of us are now full-time remote workers. Some of us are currently unemployed. Some of us are Zoom fans or GoToWebinar fans or whatever uh, virtual conferencing platform you use fans, and some of us are not. And a lot of us are just wondering if we're keeping up with the rest of our colleagues. And many people are overworking to avoid losing their jobs or doubting that they'll be able to find another one due to the pandemic's turmoil. And with the pandemic, people are increasingly working in isolation. So it's normal to feel isolated from your team. And as we've mentioned throughout this presentation so far, try not to panic because you are not alone in feeling this way. And going back to our panelists again, do you feel like the pandemic has added to your experiences with imposter syndrome? 
I think it's more indirectly that because it's harder to make a strong connection with the rest of your team and other people you work for, it's harder to get um, the kind of response that informs um, sort of your own self-identity within your workplace, I think. So I think the whole ball game is so different now. I was hired during uh, at Comcast during the pandemic. So I started remote. I'm still remote. There are people that uh, <laughs> literally joined a company after I was hired and left, and I've not met them <laughs> physically. So uh, it's 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 definitely not the you know it's definitely different. Like a lot of rules are different, and I think that also contributes to sort of the sense of am I in the right place, and is what I'm doing contributing to what the team needs um am i you know you know am i good enough like all those kind of things are can be amplified a little bit because the type of feedback that you get are a little, quite different um i i think i was pretty fortunate that my team um adapted pretty well i think you know I, I, maybe maybe andrew can can speak on on this as well um because as a data scientist, a lot of the things that we do are quite um, independent on my own. Um, that is a good and a bad thing, I guess, you know, depending on your perspective. Uh, but my team was very good at um, having a good balance of um, the frequency of touch points um, during the week. Um, it was my, <laughs> actually, I don't have a direct manager now because he just left the company as well. Uh, but my former manager was very good at um, giving good feedbacks, um, even when he wanted more. Um, so I, I feel very fortunate in that. I, that definitely helps. Like, I feel like these are things that are outside of my control. Um, you know, there are, I can't really control how other people react to my work or to my, um, you know, how I conduct myself in the company. I can only like sort of do my best. But like the the sort of danger to that is exactly as what Andrew said earlier. It's like you 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 can fall into this situation where you constantly feel like you have to prove yourself. You constantly have to do the 150 percent um, so that you can say like, no, you made the right decision. You hired me. Like you can fall. It's easy to fall into that. And when you're isolated in the it, you know, I work from home and you know there's nobody else here during the day. Um, it can really be easy to fall into a zone where you just keep going and you're like, no, I can, oh, this one more thing I can do and it'll be even better um, because you you are seeking, I'm seeking that like affirmation from others. And like, the, I feel like sometimes the only way is to just, you know, over deliver and, and uh, that can be, uh, you know, very tricky. So I guess on my end, it's actually been, I haven't shared in the common statistical problem, and I maybe I'm just you know very fortunate that I'm generally pretty introverted, but uh, also that I have a really great team at NN Data where we have a data science team that we work together pretty closely and keep each other updated. Even when we're on separate projects, you know we interface pretty frequently, and even though it's all been remote since I did start during the pandemic, as Matt did, uh, where we've had you know no, I've never met any of my team in person. So I, I literally don't, I, I've never been in the person, I've never been in the same city as any of them. So we're as bad as you can get. Same state. <laughs> yeah, I've never been in the same state as any of them. Um, so it's only recently I've been in the same country as them. I've been in a lot of the pandemic in Canada. So it's, you know, it's been very remote, but also very connected. So I guess in that sense, I'm, I'm lucky and I have not felt any changes in the rates of imposter syndrome due to the pandemic it's usually just due to it's more dependent on whatever it is we're doing and whether i just end up feeling like i did well that day or on that project or in that week or for this meeting or seminar or whatever it is i'm doing so not to believe the point but I, I think that for me the pandemic has not mattered in that sense but i can definitely imagine how a general erosion of social support networks our mental well-beings would lead to, among other things, a decline in the feeling of belongingness at a workplace. 
I can relate to you both too. I've only met a handful of my team in person. Most of them, we actually, a lot of us are in the same state but have not had an opportunity to meet in person. And I think that's going to be common for a lot of people that are working now, especially if you transferred or started at a new role at the beginning of the pandemic as well, you may not have a chance to have met your colleagues. But if you were previously working in person and then switched to online, this could attribute to you feeling a little bit more isolated versus starting a new role at this time as well. So moving on to our, our next point, we've seen that recent studies have shown that 70% of people feel insecure and unworthy of their accomplishments. And this is even more evident in fields like STEM because the rate of change and advancement is so rapid no human could ever keep up, but for some reason, we all feel like we should. Imposter syndrome is widespread in the STEM field with 58% of tech employees reporting feeling imposter syndrome in various stages of their careers. STEM is a very challenging field to break into, especially for women, and the industry is constantly changing and expectations are so high in the STEM field. For example, you may see a job posting for an entry-level STEM job that is requesting three to five years of experience. And looking at that posting, that can definitely feel overwhelming. But it doesn't always happen when starting at a new company or in a new role. It can happen well into your career, perhaps when you're tasked with a new project that seems difficult or overwhelming. Maybe a new team member joins and you feel intimidated by their skill set. The point is that it can really happen to anyone at any time. And going back to our panelists again, I know we briefly talked about this, but what was your experience when you transitioned into your first STEM role and how did you feel? Um, I guess I'll take this one first. Uh, I did feel definitely intimidated. So I, I, as I mentioned, I joined NN Data. Uh, very shortly after finishing the Data Incubator project, I was fresh out of the, you know, fresh with the stamp ink drying digitally, I suppose. Uh, on my profile from the data incubator. I really didn't have that much programming experience. Most of my experience that involving data was just, you know, raw statistics, you know, Bayesian and classical stuff. So I was just, you know, pretty wet behind the ears when it comes to machine learning and the more advanced techniques that we use in industry today. Um, and I was joining a very, what I, what I see, what appeared to me today, and, or then and still does appear to me to be a very qualified and advanced team uh, at NN Data, uh, many of whom actually are fellow TDI graduates. So uh, <laughs> lots of people there. So, um, but I, I think that while I felt like I didn't belong, what I managed to focus on was just finding, and, I, and, and also but it didn't help that we were like at the end of a contract cycle. So I was jumping in like head first into like deliverables. So we were, we were like on the, you know, kind of crunch time on a few things. So it was, it was a very interesting time to get started. But what I found helped me a lot was I didn't understand the full project. I didn't have time. I was, there was too much going on. I found something little that I could do. It's like, okay, I'm going to figure out how to do this, but I'm going to figure out how to do it. I'm going to do it. And I did. And just contributing that little bit of code, that little snippet made me feel a bit better. And it helped, it helped the project. It was, it was a useful thing. It wasn't like I was just, you know, you know, folding paper cranes or something that was, you know, not helpful for the for the company or the project. I found something that was not being done. I found a gap to fill that was, you know, within the data science realm. And I filled it. And I jumped in and said, yes, I'll do this. Or when whenever the boss, you know, our, our chief executive, you know, the chief, not chief, the chief data scientist who was in charge of all data science, like, we need somebody to do this thing. This thing isn't being done. I'd say, I'll do it. And I knew I didn't know how to do it, but I also knew that you know, given the training I had experienced, given my mathematical knowledge, given the training I had from TDI, I knew I could figure out how to do it. And, or if I couldn't figure out how to do it, then there'd probably be some other barrier that I could reach out for help on because my team was very helpful. Uh, so I jumped in, I did things, and just the act of doing things and contributing and having myself be good enough for production was enough to kind of shake that off, at least for a time. As, as Sierra mentioned, it does come back you know, it, it, it is a it is a hydra that, you know, you, you chop off one head and three more take its place in time, but at least for a time. And even, you know, to this day, when I, when I fell into that kind of block, it's like, okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to find something and I'm going to do it. And that helps. That's a great point, Andrew. And we will talk about leveraging opportunities as well, as that's a great tip for overcoming it. So thank you so much for sharing that. I don't want to cut you off, Matt, if you had anything you wanted to share as well. Yeah. I, 
it's funny because I feel like I have been in STEM field all my life, I guess. Uh, if you count STEM academia, STEM field, uh, it's a little bit different, but I feel like when I was a grad student and later on when I was a, you know, I was working as, it's hard to explain what, what I did when I was at a university. I guess ostensibly I was a research faculty, but I did a whole bunch of stuff that I also feel like a, I was not hired for, or B, I don't really have the skill for it. I just have to wing it. Um, so, you know, that also qualifies as, uh, you know, giving me symptoms of imposter syndrome. I, I definitely think that, you know, um, Sierra's point of the knowledge field moving really quick is especially true. Uh, it manifests in a different way. When I was a grad student, I feel like, you know, there's a, you know, 50 papers that comes out every week that's like seems to be relevant to my research and I feel like I need to be on top of it, but like it's impossible to be on top of it. Um, and then now, you know, I don't even have time, I feel like, you know, working full time as a data scientist to keep track of, you know, sort of the cutting edge of that field. Um, I don't feel like I'm expected to, to know it, but it also I feel like I should, you know, it's, again, it's that uh, um, sort of internal conflict. It's like you feel like, oh, I have been entrusted this responsibility and I should, um, you know, know these things, quote unquote. Uh, but really, nobody, nobody's asking for that. You're, you're asked to do certain specific tasks. And, you know, as Andrew mentioned, I feel like uh, for, for, for us, you know, we have a lot of, we spend a lot of time in school and we have a lot of training in critical thinking and really getting, figuring things out. And that's really actually an important, important skill. Like if you don't know something and you're able to independently figure out how to do it, that's actually very valuable and should not be discounted. And I feel like the more I've worked in this field, even as kind of like a, you know, big career pivot, not the traditional route, I feel like, um, you know, holding on to that, that, you know, even if I don't know how to do this now, even if I don't know this piece of knowledge, even though I feel like I should know and should know how to do, should know these things, um, if I can figure it out tomorrow or next week or whatever, if I can have people that I can rely on to, to obtain that knowledge, then that's enough, then that's good, you know? Um, so I think um, that has been one of the big tools that I, I, I use to, uh, to combat, combat this. Yeah, and if I could just say, Oh, sorry. No, sorry. I'll say one more thing about the like. I forgot. I forgot to address the fast moving of knowledge, and yeah, my, I, similar to Matt, I think that the the fast moving knowledge. The one thing I really want to say about that is that I struggled with that, especially when I was first starting getting into data science. I felt like I needed to know everything, all the latest methods about every possible thing, but that's impossible. It is not. No one can do that, as the quote uh, succinctly put it. And the solution is don't try. No, whenever you need to do a thing, look up the, the latest, you know, the latest methods about how to do thing at the time and have a you know, background knowledge of the general kinds of methods that exist. But know that, you know, whenever you start a project, you'll need to update your information. But it's impossible. It'll drive you insane to try and keep up with every single advancement in every single aspect of data science because there are so many. And it, it's, it, it is not possible for a human being to do so. Don't try to do it. Just keep up with what you need to keep up with. Do what you need to do. And if you have some time and you want to look up something, do it. But don't feel like you need to know everything all the time. Remember that what I mentioned earlier about the angles of information. There's going to be somebody who knows something more than you about some aspect of something all the time. Just know what you need to know. Be an expert in the thing you need to be an expert in. And be ready to expand when you need to expand. But don't try and expand in every direction at once because that's how you know a balloon pops. That's a great point, Andrew. That's definitely one of the tips that we're going to go over to help you overcome it. And uh, we'll go into that in a little bit more detail, but first we're going to talk about imposter syndrome at the data incubator. So imposter syndrome isn't always associated with a new job or role. It can also impact you while applying or enrolling in continuing education programs like the data incubator programs. We've heard from our students that it typically happens in one of three places. One, during the application process, you may be overwhelmed by the application, coding challenge, or interview. Two, after receiving acceptance, 
you may be thinking you're not qualified for the program or you won't be able to keep up or three after starting the program and we typically hear from our students in the first two weeks that it's very challenging and they get overwhelmed at that point and they wonder if they're able to keep up and continue on in the program i'm so glad we have our panelists here who are also tdi graduates who can talk a, more, a little bit more about this and just talk about your experience during the application process and do you feel like imposter syndrome made it challenging for you to complete the program can't remember whose turn it is to go first now uh let's go with matt if you're ready i don't mean to call on you sure uh <laughs> I feel like it's less about the imposter syndrome. Maybe during the so so the application process, there's like a take home, and um, there's also like a like a group interview kind of like over Zoom when I did it. I don't know if the format has changed. I feel like that may be manifested a little bit during the the group interview because there are you know staff from the program who are kind of scrutinizing what you're presenting, and then there there are sort of your peer. Uh, you know, um, applicants there. Um, so the pressure is definitely on and you're like, oh, and you look at other people's projects or like their pitch and you're like, oh, that looks really good. Oh man, man, how, how do that compare to what I have? So that definitely is a thing. I feel like during the bulk of the application process, we do have to do this like lengthy technical take home. Uh, it's less about, <laughs> it's less about the imposter project because it was like, you know, I'm, I was under pressure. It's just like, oh, I just need to figure out how to do this. Um, so that, that didn't really, uh, come to the front as much. Um, I, to me, I feel like imposter syndrome and it's related uh, all these other things that are that can manifest um, are more of a chronic thing. Um, it tends to affect me the most when I am in a longer term engagement with something like in a job position or as a grad student and less about like a specific ac acute um, instance of of, of, of um, like you know maybe like when I was preparing maybe the entire job search process that definitely I feel like man am I even you know going into the right field like do I have what it takes that definitely comes up but um I yeah I, yeah I think that's I think that's pretty fair to say yeah how your experiences with applying and, and going through the program? Yeah, so I definitely got a front load of imposter syndrome during the application process because at the time I was not really familiar with Python. I one of the first things I did with Python was prepare the little pitch for the, I mean, basically the, the data incubator uh, application was the first thing I did in Python, uh, and I ended up looking up a bunch of stuff and. Uh, looking into you know a bunch of different softwares and packages to make the stuff I want to do work and you know in hindsight it's like okay that that ended up working out okay but at the time I was thinking oh man I have no idea what I'm doing this could be complete garbage I have no idea these people are going to look at this and think that I have no idea what I'm talking about because I'm probably doing something obvious and dumb uh, and so that was something that really got to me I think also when I was towards the end of the program and well actually in the middle of the program yeah as matt mentioned seeing other people's projects and thinking like oh man mine isn't that sophisticated or uh what that well put together they're way better at putting visuals or something you know you always find something that somebody does better than you and you think oh man i need to do that better and in the interview phase when i was towards the end of the program i was fortunate enough and you know i did because sometimes you get in these mindsets and this is the kind of thing that imposter syndrome can do to you even though i was getting interviews i was thinking oh man i'm I'm not qualified for these things. They're asking me like these data engineering questions sometimes. And I don't know how to, I'm, maybe what I'm saying is dumb, I don't know. And you, you always think about how to, how to frame the experience you're having in, if not the worst possible light, at least a negative light. It's like, I should have been, you know, in hindsight, it's like, oh man, I should have been really happy. I was getting interviews as opposed to, oh crap, I'm such an imposter. I'm so dumb. I can't, you know, answer all of these esoteric questions that they have, you know, perfectly just at the drop of a hat. And it's, it, there was definitely, you know, obviously eventually I did get a job and it was, I'm, I'm very happy with it. And it was one that I think gave me a lot of interesting ways to use the skills that I developed both in, you know, my grad school tenure and at TDI, but it was definitely a, pro, a slog mentally, internally to get myself to accept that I was ready for it, for the reasons I described. 
Perfect. Thank you. So we're going to move on to the imposter syndrome paradox here. And people with imposter syndrome are not frauds. They are high achievers who are exceptionally competent, skilled, and often extremely successful. The struggle is often internal and they feel that no matter how hard they work, they end up in the same place of, I'm not good enough. And people who are caught in the imposter syndrome cycle feel trapped and unable to go on or get unstuck. And these feelings can make it difficult to set limits and commit to healthy work-life balances, both which are necessary for personal success. And I know I briefly mentioned the imposter syndrome cycle, and now we're going to look at it in more detail. So it can start off with you being assigned a new project or task. Anxiety takes over and you might either procrastinate or overprepare to the point of stress. You complete the project and you get a brief sense of success and you may rationalize that success away with, I got lucky this time. Then a spike of self-doubt, which can lead to feelings of fraud. Maybe you might think everyone will realize someone else will do a better job next time. The cycle continues to loop over and over, and you may find yourself feeling trapped too. Well, we're here to share tips to help you break the cycle as well. We not only want to help you understand what imposter syndrome is and how it may impact you, but we also want to help you overcome it. And we found that there are six steps you can take to help reframe your thinking and combat imposter syndrome. And we're going to dive into each of these steps in more detail. So the first step in our six step plan is to focus on the facts. Imposter syndrome makes you believe you aren't qualified for your position. However, these emotions are frequently founded on fear rather than fact. And separating your feelings from the fact is the most effective strategy to combat imposter syndrome. And I know that sounds easier said than done and you might be thinking, how can I do that? Well, you can start by building up your confidence by becoming more aware of your strengths and weaknesses. You can conduct a personal SWOT analysis where you analyze your strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats to discover what you're best at and to think about how you can minimize your weaknesses. So for your strengths, what do you do well? This could be a coding language you've mastered or another tool you feel confident in. Weaknesses, what needs improvement? Maybe you're great at coding, but your data visualization skills need a bit of work. And opportunities, I know Andrew talked about this a little bit. How can you leverage your strengths in your role? How can you use what you're good at in your role or while working on a project? And then for threats, do your weaknesses expose your project or business to failure? So for our panelists, have you ever done a SWOT analysis? If not, is this something that you would like to try? I mean, never explicitly in those words, but. I have that. I think this is a general way I've gotten myself out of a, a lot of the ruts I have been stuck in over over time. Especially, it was more of a you know ad hoc coping mechanism I developed for myself probably in graduate school because it was you know that cycle you described was basically every day of my life when I was in graduate school. So I definitely had to go some way of coping. And so while I've never done a SWOT analysis formally, you know, as here. I have done a lot of these things thinking about, okay, what are the facts? You know, if I, if I were to, if someone else were to tell me the things that I'm doing, would I think they're an imposter? That's kind of the, the, another thing that I do is like, you know, if I were to, you know, you know, if I were to somehow, you know, get out of my own head and look at myself from a third person perspective and see the things that I'm doing, would I think that I'm unqualified for the job that I'm doing? And most of the time the answer is no. It's like, no, I'm, I'm doing what I would expect someone in my position to be doing. It's probably right. exactly the qualified thing to be doing. Mm -hmm. um, and a, so, oh, sorry. I was gonna say, there's a lot of power in reframing how you think about yourself. And we've talked a bit about how imposter syndrome is that internal feeling, but you can flip that by reframing how you think about yourself internally as well. And as Andrew's talking about, looking at it from an outside perspective, looking at what you're doing, but also we'll talk a bit more about asking for feedback or looking for mentors that can help you, help reshape your thinking as well. So, Matt, is there anything that you wanted to add? If not, we can go to our next step. Yeah, I think it's similar to Andrew. I don't think I explicitly use these steps, but I think the key here is going back to at the beginning of the presentation is to be reflective in a healthy way. Think about, you know, 
don't just like do something and you're endured it, you survived it, and like you forgot everything about it. Like you're like, you know, just reflect on the experience on especially balance on what went well and what could have been improved. I think it that's the key. If you only focused on sort of what you did bad or what could be better, then you know, you'll I feel like it's easy again to fall into that that um that cycle. So the the next step in our plan here is to acknowledge, validate, and let go. We've talked about focusing on the facts, but that doesn't mean your feelings aren't valid. Combating imposter syndrome isn't about ignoring your emotions. Rather, that while feelings are important, they are just fact feelings and don't necessarily reflect reality. Feeling unqualified doesn't mean you actually are, and rather the best method to combat this feeling is to acknowledge that you're feeling inadequate, validate that it's okay, and then let go of those feelings if you're not grounded in truth. And this can be accomplished by reframing your thought. As I mentioned earlier, there's a lot of power in thoughts. Our perspective on the world and of ourselves has the ability to shape our reality, both positively and negatively. And remember, imposter syndrome is the internalized feeling that you are not good enough. And if you reshape the way that you think about yourself and set realistic goals, you can combat that internal feeling. And in turn, you'll begin to view yourself as deserving of your place. This can mean the deserving of your new role, your place on a team, or praises for your accomplishments. So just remember to be kind to yourself. And then the next step in our plan to overcome imposter syndrome is to share how you're feeling. This is easier said than done because, again, imposter syndrome can feel very isolating. You may feel like you're the only one who feels this way, and speaking up may expose you as a fraud. And we're hoping that this presentation today is showing you that you're not alone in feeling this way. Reach out and talk to someone you trust and share your concerns. This can be a friend or a colleague, and you may be surprised to see how many people relate to how you feel. We also recommend looking for a mentor. Find those in your field that you look up to and have an honest conversation with them about how they've improved their technical and soft skills and what challenges they faced. You'll likely find that even those with lots of experience have been in your shoes and can provide you with the resources you need to improve. The next step in our plan here, again, is looking, learning from your peers and your team. A common symptom of imposter syndrome is comparing yourself to your peers and thinking you're worse at your job than they are. The reality is no one is a master at everything, but everyone is a master of something. So when working with your peers, you can exchange knowledge while mastering new skills. So don't fall into the habit of comparing yourself to others. Recognize the value you add while learning new things from your peers. Maybe someone on your team has advanced experience in machine learning, and that's something you've identified as an area of improvement. And you may have a lot of experience in building and training neural networks, and this may be something your colleague would like to learn more about. So rather than view each other as competition, you can work together to expand your knowledge. And then the last step in our plan here is to pat yourself on the back once in a while. Sometimes the best way to invite imposter syndrome is to face it head on. So celebrate your accomplishments the next time you feel good about something you've done. Share your accomplishments with your coworkers or someone you trust outside of work, such as a friend or family member. And remember that people who have imposter syndrome are not frauds. They are high achievers, extremely competent, skilled, and often very successful. And if you believe that your life is shaped by your own actions, choices, and decisions, you can take responsibility for your achievements as well as your shortcomings and recognize that it was your expertise and talent that empowered you to achieve your goal or complete an important project the next time you accomplish something. So keep a record of positive feedback and praise that you receive. Look back at it the next time you hear that negative inner voice, and this will help you to take the sting out of any criticism you're directing at yourself and provide a much needed boost of confidence. So for our panelists, do you have a way of keeping track of your accomplishments or positive feedback you've received? And if so, how has this helped you? I guess I'll turn and say, actually, I do not. So maybe that's a piece of advice I should start following. <laughs> that might help, but I actually do not. So I can't say how it has affected me because I have not done it.
Or another point is if you have heard little feedback or if you haven't, how could you go about asking for it? Uh, yeah, I think asking for feedback is is important. And I, the thing is, what I've, I guess what I can say is that when I've gotten feedback from people, you know, in, in uh, my company and in data since I've started there, you know, I've had projects and I've always been like, okay, they're going to give me feedback. Let's, let's you know, gird myself for it. But usually it's very positive, much more positive than I expect. Like, oh yeah, this was great. And, you know, it's very impressive, you know, presentation, whatever, you know, this product does things. And I'm like, okay, well, I guess they were happy with it. So I guess I was worried for nothing. I thought I was doing poorly when I wasn't. So usually when I get feedback, it's, you know, it helps to remind myself, you know, at least if I, even if I don't think it's good, the, the, the people I'm working for think it's good, which is really what matters. So uh, that's, that's something to be, it's something at least. And Matt, I know you mentioned you got some great feedback from a previous manager of yours. Have you had any way of keeping track of that or that feedback that you've had? How has it motivated you to improve? I guess I, I don't formally keep track of it, but I do take notes. And um, I think feedback, no, no matter if it's positive or negative, I keep track of them in the form of these kind of notes that I have, less about overcoming uh, imposter syndrome, more just because I feel like it's beneficial to know the next time, okay, this is what I need to do next time. And they like that, so I need to do more of that next time kind of thing. So it's much more practical in that way. Not that overcoming <laughs> imposter syndrome is not practical, but I, I guess that was not the primary intention of what I was doing. But I do think feedback is very important, but that, and, and uh, sometimes can be difficult to kind of if, especially if the team or the company doesn't have a good culture of that. Um, I feel like uh, just like any tools or anything, if there's a sort of a double-edged sword here, I, you know, I've been fortunate that my team has find a pretty good balance in that. People are very, um, you know, colloquially, colloquially, they're very chill about their feedback, you know, you know, they just tell you like, oh, what about this? Oh, question about this. Oh, maybe if you add this, it'll it'll be clearer. Like you know, like people are just kind about their feedback, even if it's you know like, you know, it's things that one can improve on. Um, I think in the workplace, if it, if it's a pretty toxic environment, it it's very hard to manage that, and also your own sort of struggle with imposter syndrome. So that's like an entirely different topic because there's so much mm -hmm. you can't control. But I think if there's the opportunity to kind of cultivate that culture, you can always start by, you know, I think everyone loves like good feedback, even when it's, you know, constructive criticism. So, so mm -hmm. if you, if, if that's something that I can control, if I am very mindful of how I give feedback, I think that, um, that also factors in, in, in sort of cultivating that culture. Um, I do ask sometimes directly for feedback if uh, I think what's most helpful is to be very specific about it. Um, I don't think it's helpful when you just like any feedback, you know, because it's like kind of, you know, where do I even start? But like ask for very specific things. Like, do you think this slide is clear of bringing this specific thing across to this specific audience? Something like that, very specific. Um, or I have a question about this methodology because I think there is this thing, like what do you all think about this specific technical uh, challenge that I might be having? Like just be very specific. Um, and I think that has been very helpful for me because then it helps with you know my manager or my colleagues to really also, uh, they might not be even thinking about that or paying mm -hmm. specific attention to that thing that I'm struggling with in that piece of work and you know that can become an asset because now they are shifting their focus in helping me trying to figure out um, what can be improved on and uh, that in the then in and of itself I feel like builds better connection within the team as well. Awesome thank you for sharing so at this point I want to open up to you a couple questions we have some questions and tips in our Q&A box here and for our attendees